Very happy to be joined now here at the Combine by Browns General Manager John Dorsey. And sir, what is it like, take us back through a year ago to a year today, what a transformation for this organization under your watch. It's been fun. Now, before we start here, I do want to say congratulations. Oh, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, outstanding. Thank you. Um, there it is. Yeah. There it is. Um, it's been awesome. I mean, it's been um, everything I dreamt it would be. Um, Any time that you can see an organization grow uh, right before your very eyes is exciting. We have a lot of growth to do. Um, you can see the excitement that the fans bring. I mean, the, you can just feel the passion of the Cleveland Browns fan and then just watch the excitement um, of the players within that locker room when they start to understand that, you know what, this winning stuff's pretty fun. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things positive growing here. What we as an organization have to do, have to sustain this thing, move this thing forward, uh, set that game plan out, stick true to the game plan that we lay out. Uh, from a personnel standpoint, we have to get coaches, some players. And then the coaches got to coach these players up, and then we all have to act as unison as one in this thing because we're all in this thing together. Um, and then, you know what? Set the bar high. To set the standards high moving into the 2019 season and just, you know, teach them up and let them run for the goals. You mentioned the coaches, and it seems like in the building there is a cohesiveness between your philosophy and that of the head coach, Freddie Kitchens, and you can just kind of feel a camaraderie and a common sense of purpose with the quality of men brought in by Freddie and you on that staff with Steve Wilkes, Mike Prefer, and of course Todd Munkin. It just, there. It, would you say that this is having that alignment is something that you're excited about? Because it just seems around the building, everybody seems to have that common purpose and goal, and it's real and genuine. No, there's, there's, uh, you know, Freddie assembled a, a heck of a, heck of a staff. But what's fun is, I love going into work every day, and you can feel the energy within the building. I know we're in the honeymoon phase, but you have men of character, men of principle, and any time you can do that. And then, and then on top of that, you know, each person basically rolls their sleeves up and lives by that mantra. They have no ego, and they want to get better every day. And what I can't wait for is to watch this coaching staff begin to teach and develop the players in the OTA season. Now, to me, that's where it's all going to be fun because we all come in this thing together and we're all building as one as, you know, I couldn't be happier uh, where we are as an organization with regards to the coaching staff and, uh, and, and the working relationship with the personnel staff. And it's certainly you can feel that, as you mentioned, in the building. You also probably couldn't be happier with your quarterback, Baker Mayfield. You know, a year ago we sat here, we talked about, and we'll get into the most important positions for a football team, but quarterback number one, it's a quarterback league. How nice is it to go into a draft process and a free agency process knowing that you don't have to worry about that piece? Well, you always worry. I mean, uh, you, all, uh, you know, any organization who begins to get complacent and doesn't worry, it's not going to work. So you tricked, you, t you focused on that. Do you have the guy that you know is your starter as of today going into the season? Well, as, as I look at this thing, it's the most important position. We all know that. Now what you can do is then you can begin to methodically begin to add more pieces as, as we move through the process. That's what that does. Now what you do is when you have a quarterback uh, like a Baker Mayfield, you know, I expect, you know, I, I think that the, the greatest learning curve that he's going to see is from year one to year two. Uh, I, I think all rookies have been basically been, when they come into the league after being drafted, they've been going after this thing for a year and a half. He's actually had a chance to step back, add some balance to his life, and get a clear perspective, set some goals for the 19th season, and then now let's forge ahead. Um, because at that position, there's still a lot of football left. And, I mean, he's going to get better in year two. So what you want to ask him to do is, you know what, Baker, challenge him, but get him to get better every day to, you know, all those little small stepping stones. Because then when he comes into like year three and year four, he's still going to be learning stuff. So I, that's, it, it's exciting. It certainly is exciting. And a year ago, I asked you the top five import, most important positions in the NFL. And at that time a year ago, you said quarterback, pass rusher, cornerback, guy who catches the football, wide receiver, and offensive tackle, you had fifth. Is that still true today? And given that we can take number one off the list for now as a priority, what would slide into maybe six, seven in your, in your as the I'm NFL's not going to prioritize all of you. I just, you asked for five, I gave you five. Okay, okay can I get two more? No. 
Fair enough. No. You're the man? Okay. That's no, fine. I'm not going to give you two more. Okay, five, quarterback. Well, don't, don't forget. We got I that. I got him, yeah. So then we go work on the other pieces. Go work see on. If, see if we can get those other pieces aligned. Is right. it pretty nice that your top three, you have a number one overall pick at quarterback, a number one overall pick at a pass rusher, and the fourth overall pick that you selected last year at cornerback in Denzel Ward? Let's just hope after year three you're feeling this good about them as we speak. Indeed. As you think about last year and the way that you, when you came in, I know that you felt there were clearly a certain number of holes on this roster. How, how good do you think you've done in terms of, maybe not, how, let me rephrase that. How much have you cut into that number? How much more comfortable are you with the roster and how much work still needs to be done? Well, I think there's work to be done every year. Uh, rosters are gonna turn over um, more than people realize. Um, you came in third place in AFC North. Are you content with that? I'm not. No, I know you're so not. So why not, why not begin to methodically build those pieces that you've identified that need to be upgraded? And we're going to go do that. And we're going to, again, try to put as, as much talent as we can on that field at all the different positions. So we're going to use every avenue and every platform possible to try to acquire those players. And you know what? We're going to try to do it. And hopefully it works out 70, 80 percent like you hope the plan laid out. That certainly would be good. One thing I have a question for you is in the evolution of the NFL game where the ball's coming out quicker than ever before. In the past, you thought of a pass rusher as a guy from the edge. But it seems in today's game, getting to the quarterback from the interior is maybe as important, if not more important, with how quickly the ball is getting out. That's the shortest distance. Is that something that's kind of changed, you know, and perhaps your perception of where you need to find pass rush from? No, I think I, I think uh, Steve Wilkes uh, says that you know you can generate a pass rush from anywhere. It's how you go about crafting that pass rush. Uh, but at the end of the day, my long-term goal is to make sure we have four pass rushers on the front there. So hopefully, by the end of this whole process and this construction phase, we have four really good pass rushers up there, to all playing together. Go that's, that's the goal. Yeah, go harass people up there. That's okay. And you said earlier you are looking to get longer on the interior of your defensive line. For people like me who don't quite understand what you mean, can you explain that in kind of layman's terms and what that means, what that looks like? Well, in the layman's terms of it is length means one thing. If you have a long enough length and quick enough hands and you can get your – get your hands on the offensive blockers before they get them on you, your length naturally is going to give you an advantage. Like a reach for a boxer. Exactly, like a reach for a boxer. So it necessarily doesn't have to be the height. The length always helps. On I've always seen the really good interior rushers or defensive end rushers, they have length. And to me, you know, I like, you know, I, I so personally like guys that are tall and long, but, you know, we'll see as it goes along. When you think about approaching free agency again in a great position in terms of salary cap space, I know you brought your cell phone out in your press conference earlier open to trades because a year ago you had a, a, a great day where you had three trades, Demarius Randall, Tyrod Taylor, Jarvis Landry. How do you kind of balance the free agency trade acquisition with the draft plans as well in terms of addressing and improving and driving competition on this roster? I think it's called smart acquisition. And what you have to do is – you have to build that plan we keep talking about and stay consistent through that game plan, have a degree of flexibility in there, and just see if you can chip away at it. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's, not, it's not a magic pill. It's hard work. It's hard work and preparation, and that's kind of what you do, and hopefully this thing works itself out. When you think about going into a draft with a roster that's significantly improved, what's the ideal number of draft picks for you in a class? Because once a roster gets good, it would be hard to have 10 guys get drafted and make the team, although you certainly could go out and, and select 10 guys worthy of making the football team. My God, if I could have 10 or 11 draft picks every year, I'd take them. I would take them. Yeah. Uh, because it gives you that much, it gives you options. And that's all you can ask for in today's environment of, of the NFL is, you know, give me some options. And a lot of draft picks give you a lot of options. Take us through, if you don't mind, just back channel. How does a trade negotiation actually work in the NFL? Well, it's, you want the basics? Yeah, I'll take the basics. If you want to give a little color to that, that'd be great. But I'm just, you know, just one of those things that's interesting. Well, it's, it's never agreed. You know, it's like it's the old adage, it's never agreed upon until the ink dries on a piece of paper. That's right. So I live by that ink drying on a piece of paper before I'd say it's official. Okay. Do you enjoy that aspect of it, going through and talking to your peers and trying to improve your team and create win-win scenarios? The organization 
enjoys winning and giving the organization an opportunity to win. To me, the, um, it's just watching the organization work diligently day in and day out to try to achieve a goal. To me, that's the fun of it. What are your goals and expectations for this team, given where you sit right now, knowing what you can add to it as you head into the 2019 season? I want to be competitive in the AFC North. Um, I want us to be better than we were last year. I want us to work. When we walk in that building every day, regardless of who you are, let's do something not only get yourself better, but get the Cleveland Browns better. And then you know what? That's a good day. And if you can take that approach every day, you know what? Everybody's working towards the same objective and same goals, regardless if it's, you know, a player downstairs or, or you know, Dean and Jimmy Haslam. You know, that's how I look at it. Absolutely. And one guy who showed you something that you decided you wanted him to still remain a part of the Cleveland Browns, Greg Robinson. I know that deal got done late last week. You know, what did he show you? And, you know, in a one-year deal, it's got an opportunity for him to really kind of bet on himself, prove himself, but also show the organization, hey, I want to be here for the long haul. He does want to be here. He actually uh, had, has told me that more than one time, that how much he loves it here in Cleveland. He's a young man. He's 25 years old. Um, he is exceptionally talented. Um, when he was inserted into the starting lineup, good things started to happen. And I can see exponential growth from him still, still happening. Um, and I'm excited for him to um, be coached by James Campen because I think, I think James is going to do a heck of a job. And I think Greg is really going to enjoy uh, working alongside of uh, James Campen in, in, the, in the months to come. I don't know quite how to phrase this question because I know you'll say you enjoy all of it, but is there a certain satisfaction, maybe more so, in finding a guy like a Robinson who was highly thought of, Brashad Perriman, a former first-round pick, where it didn't quite pan out, and then bringing them in, betting on that talent, discovering them, and then seeing them start to realize their potential? No, I think it's 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 reflective of the, uh, of the guys that do all the work in the personnel department. Those guys tirelessly work, and they're committed. They're committed. They come to work every day, like we say. They get better, and the organization gets better. When when those guys begin to come up with suggestions of you know maybe this guy, maybe this guy's, uh, they're given ownership into their craft. And once they're given ownership in their craft, go run with it, and go make yourself as good as you want to be. And that, that's just to to watch the guys in the personnel department work this year. Um, it's you know I couldn't be happy with what what you know you know that they've accomplished this year. When you walk around this combine, what do you notice anything different from the way people are either looking at you, talking about, talking to you, talking about the Cleveland Browns from your first combine as the general manager of the Browns? It shows me that there's a lot of Cleveland Browns fans of people <laughs> don't realize. It shows you what impact the Cleveland Browns have in terms of the National Football League. It shows you that they truly are one of the marquee franchises in the National Football League. You know what? I'm proud to be a member of it, and, you know, I couldn't be happier. And we couldn't be happier to have you. Thank you so much for the time. I know you've got a lot to get done here at the Combine and get this roster where you want it so that this team can go out and be a winner for this city in 2019. You know, I'm going to tell you one story here. Is okay. I had breakfast this morning with a guy named John Wooten. Uh -huh. John Wooten played for the Cleveland Browns back in the 60s. I don't know if you remember that. And you know what really made me feel proud to be a Cleveland Brown. He goes, John, you guys got this thing going in the right direction. The alumni are so happy for you guys. Just keep this thing going. And you know what? From a from a from a guy myself personally, that kind of touched me a little bit. And I'm like going, you know what? Who are the Cleveland Browns? But those guys that once played and put on those jerseys. And John Wooten was one of those. So that kind of touched my soul a little bit. I thought that was kind of neat. That's awesome. Listen, you have a lot of fans around the Cleveland Browns, whether the past players, fans, etc., and they're all excited to see what you're going to do next. So thank you, and thanks for the time today, and good luck to everything. Thank you, Nathan.